Today's talk by Bhante is living in times of uncertainty. Understanding how life works will enable us to be more resilient in modern times of uncertainty, like the current COVID-19 pandemic. Bhante is a graduate in electrical engineering from Sydney University, Australia. And he received his higher ordination as a bhikkhu under Sadama Ramsi Sayadaw in 2004. Bhante has received serious contemplative training under Pa'ao Sayadaw. He finds that studying the original words of the Buddha according to the system of listening, contemplating, meditating has greatly enhanced his understanding and practice of the Dhamma. Over to you, Bhante. Let's put our hands together to welcome Bhante. We just pay homage to the Buddha first, sir. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Okay. Understanding, seeing, or recognizing a few reality of life to me will totally change our relationship with our uncertainty in life, including the current COVID-19 pandemic. To me, the way of wisdom, which is seeing the reality, is the best and the fastest and the most lasting way. And definitely, you become more resilient. And anyway, awakening to the reality of life, which is what is called Nibbana, is the aim of all Buddhists. So you will not only be able to easier for you to have resilience of mind, but also meet our goal of all Buddhists. Now, what I will do in this session is to point to you a direction to look at the reality of life. You might have different perspective of what I will be pointing at. So look at what I point at, not, not the words. Okay. So And also, please explore with curiosity and with childlike nature about the truths that I will share. Why? Because after Prince Siddhartha tried all the ascetic practices to the most extreme, he remembered that he made much better progress with his childlike nature when he was under the rose apple tree when he was around eight years old. So he returned to that method and managed to get enlightened. So I invite all of you to return to our inborn childlike nature, not the childish nature, but the childlike nature, the curiosity nature in us, the inborn happiness, happy nature, peaceful nature in us. The first reality I want to point out is that at every moment in our life, we are experiencing our thinking about our experience of life. We are not experiencing life directly. We are not experiencing the uncertainty in life, especially those caused by COVID-19 now, what we are experiencing is our thinking about the uncertainty caused by COVID-19 pandemic. Like our thinking, like how long will this pandemic last? What if I get COVID-19? What if I lose my job? What will happen next? Oh no, every day more and more people are dying. These are all our thinking about our situation in life. So, we are living in our thoughts. So if you can see that, our whole perspective of life will change. So basically, we are experiencing our thoughts, not life itself. This is very good news because you can't control what's happening out there. What's happening to you, you can't control also. But you have some degree of control on how you respond to the thinking about what happened to you. That you have a degree of control. You have no control over the pandemic, the weather, the government, the economy, your boss, your wife, your husband. You have no control over that. And many people, they come and ask me, Bante, can you help me to change my husband, change my wife, change my children? You can't. You have no control over them. Basically, you have no control over the world. But it doesn't mean that you can't do anything to make the world a better place. It just means that you can't control the result of whatever you are doing in the world. Just this, if you can embrace 
accept this truth, you have a lot more happiness and peace already because you will not be affected by whatever result, whatever outcome, because you know you can try your best, but you can't control the result, this one point. But the most important thing point is to see that all your fear, all your worry, all your depression, all your sadness, which happens more in times of uncertainty like now, comes from your thinking, not the environment, not your circumstances, not what is happening out there, which is the pandemic now. And since all our problems come from our thinking and our thinking is created by ourselves, actually we are slapping ourselves. When you really, really see that you are slapping yourselves, you will automatically stop slapping yourself. You don't have to ask me, Bhante, what technique, what method do I need to use to stop slapping myself? If you caught yourself slapping yourself, all you got to do is just see it and you won't continue slapping yourself. But if you, you are free to continue slapping yourself, knowing that you can stop anytime that you want, okay? knowing that all the thoughts are created by you, you can stop anytime you want. And if you are slapping yourself because you don't know, you don't have to blame yourself. All of us have blind spots. Sometimes we really, really think that it's my wife, it's my husband, it's my boss that caused me the problem. But once you can see that it's your thoughts, not these people, then you can stop slapping yourself. I will give you a few life, my own life examples so that you can relate to it. Okay, for me, the most obvious example is when my mom was diagnosed with cancer, I have no time to think. I just do whatever I need to do to get the best traditional treatment, the best Western treatment, whatever medicine we can get. Just keep one thing after another. There's no time to sit down to think. So I wasn't like really worried or sad or whatever. Of course, not happy, but I was just busy doing what needed to be done. Until one day I sat down and start thinking, why does this happen to me? How long would it last? Do I have I done enough or not? I became very tired, sad and depressed. So the, all this sadness, tiredness, depression comes from the thinking, not the circumstances. Because I realized that when I stop thinking and start again to do what I need to do, the tiredness and sadness automatically disappear. So clearly, the emotions come from the thinking, not the circumstances. So you, you might ask Bhante, should we stop the thinking? No. When you try to stop the thinking, more thoughts will come because you make the thoughts real. When you stop means you think the thoughts are real, they are solid, then you will not, you know, you will not be able to handle it. More and more thoughts will come. The more you fight with your thoughts, the more stuck in thoughts you become. You have to realize again with wisdom that thoughts are impermanent. You don't have to hold on to the thoughts. If you don't do that, if you don't hold on to the thoughts, they will pass and new thoughts, new fresh thoughts will come. The important thing is again through wisdom, not to regard your thoughts as ultimate reality. If you can do that, not out regard your thoughts as ultimate reality, even tons and tons of negative thoughts come, it doesn't matter because they are impermanent, they will pass. Whatever bad thoughts that come, it's okay because as long as you know it's not real, it's just thoughts, it's okay, they will pass. It's just like if you walk into a room with a very loud aircon noise, if you ignore the noise, after a while, you won't even notice that there's noise there. Understanding the reality that thoughts are not real will set you free. You don't have to do anything at all. It's just understanding, recognition, again, wisdom. But you have to see it for yourself in your daily life. Not know it conceptually. Know it conceptually is a good first step, but you have to really see, really see, as in, you know, realize it. When you can understand this reality that you know, everything is created by your thoughts and the thoughts are impermanent, you can be okay with not okay thoughts. 
and not okay. You can be okay also with not okay emotions. When you're okay with all the not okays, nothing can affect you. You become very resilient. And also, you can have silence in the middle of all the noisy thoughts. Because you know they are not real, like the aircon, loud aircon noise. I would like to give you two metaphors to help you relate to this. The first metaphor is you are like the sky with lots of thoughts, clouds passing by continuously. But being the sky, you are totally unaffected. You can take in as many clouds passing through you. There's no problem at all. Or another metaphor that I like that I recently heard is you are like flying a plane through clouds. The clouds are like your thoughts. Imagine if you think the thoughts are solid when you're flying, you'll be like, oh no, it's like there's thoughts on the right, there's clouds on the right, there's clouds on the left, and you are really stressed trying to navigate through the clouds. But because you know when you're flying, you know the clouds are not solid, you can fly through the clouds without being affected. You'll be, in fact, it's fun. You'll be like, woohoo, another clouds I go through. You are not affected by whatever negative clouds that come. And you can function peacefully through lots of clouds of uncertainty. Uncertain thoughts is not a problem to you because you know it's not real. But the key thing is to see they are like clouds. You can just go straight through them like a plane flying through clouds. And the next thing to, to realize is, this is by Albert Einstein. He said, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. So you can't, basically you can't think your way out of the problem. Okay? You, can't, you cannot solve your problems from the thinking that created it. It's scary out there in your thinking. It's scary out there in your imaginary futures and remembered past. It's scary out there in your repetitive, ruminative thinking. But inside you, where the well-being is, where the creativity is, where the, all the possibility is, it's really nice. Inside you, there is this peaceful, silent feeling like the sky. From this place, all of us, all human beings, is well designed to handle whatever that comes for us. But to come back to this natural well-being, innate well-being it does, not difficult. You just need to come back to the present moment. We do really, really well in the present moment. But when we get up in our head, we start making up scary futures or we dip back into our past and start adding reasons why things happen the way they happen and why they happen to us. It takes us away from this present moment. Being present is when we have all the resources. Being present is where we have our well-being. Being present where we have, is where we have infinite possibilities. Being present is where our creative faculties is operating at full force. All you have to do is to come back to the present. The present I'm talking about is beyond time and space. It's not a moment in time. The present is when we are not lost in our thinking about time, about anything, about space, about our problems, and so on. Okay, so it's quite simple as in, as long as you can see that your thoughts are not real, they are created by you, they are stories created by you, you the more you see, the less you will get lost in your thoughts and you will stay into the present moment. When you are at this present moment, you cannot get lost in your thoughts. You cannot do two things at the same time. Now, I will give you some real-life medical examples so that you, it, it sinks into you. Okay. The first example I want to give is there are many real-life cases documented in US, quite a number of cases, that A and B, two different persons who are totally unrelated to each other, went for medical health checkup. Okay. A was told that he has serious cancer, stage four cancer, and has only three months to live. And B was told that he has a clean view of health. He's healthy and strong. Three months later, as expected, A died. B lived on happily. But there was a problem. The hospital did a check and realized that they accidentally swapped the health report. So A was supposed to have a clean view of health and B was supposed to have serious cancer and three months to live. 
both of them were living in their thinking of life and not life itself. So when the person who is healthy thinks that he's going to die, he actually think himself to death. And the other person think himself to health. And that's how powerful our mind is. Both are living in their thinking. And similarly, so the uncertainty in the world is not the problem. Our thinking about the uncertainty is the problem. You might be asking me, Bante, then should we think positive? I'm not against thinking positive, but to me, thinking positive, when you try to think positive, then you are already assuming that your thoughts are real. Then your negative thoughts will also affect you. I'm trying to keep stressing that doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative thoughts, they are all illusions created by you. When you can accept this reality, guarantee you your life will change because you won't get trapped in your thoughts so much. Okay. Now, another real life example, which I love a lot, it's a, they can't do this anymore, unfortunately, because nowadays humans are too smart. Even the doctors cheat you to help you, you will sue them. So doctors cannot do this kind of case anymore. This is a real life case in 1957. It's a study by, done by Dr. Bruno Klopter, and he reports of a story of uh, Dr. Philip West and his patient, Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright had at once limb cancer. All treatments have failed. Time was running out. Mr. Wright's neck, chest, abdomen, armpits, and groin were filled with tumors the size of oranges. His spleen and liver were enlarged. His cancer was causing his chest to fill up two liters of milky fluid every day. Dr. West didn't expect Mr. Wright to last a week. Basically, he's in really critical, severe, like no hope already. But Mr. Wright is very desperate, has des is desperately want to live. This is one condition that helps people to live longer, so your will to live. And Mr. Wright puts his hope on a promising new drug called cryboison. That was 1957. Huh? He begged his doctor to treat him with a new drug, but the drug was only offered in clinical trials to people who are believed to have at least three months to live. So basically, Mr. Wright, it's like even too sick to qualify. They don't want to waste the drug on him or so. He's like that bad, his situation. But Mr. Wright didn't give up. He, knowing the drug existed and believing that somehow the drug has a miracle cure, he pestered his doctor until Dr. West reluctantly gave him, injected him with cryboison. Dr. West performed the procedure on Friday, but deep down, the doctor believed that Mr. Wright won't last that weekend. It's like only will last maybe two, three days. But to his utter shock on Monday, three days later, Dr. West found the patient walking out of bed. According to Dr. Clofter, who wrote the report, Mr. Wright's tumor masses had melted like snowballs on a hot stove and were half the original size. 10 days later, after the first dose of Cryboison don't need you know, even a second dose like what we need. Mr. Wright left the hospital apparently cancer-free, only 10 days. Mr. Wright was praising, so it's all in his thinking, okay? You know, because it's no other patient have this effect. And in fact, I'll, I'll say that Mr. Wright was praising cryboison drug as a miracle drug for two months until a scientific magazine began reporting that actually cryboison was not effective at all. They did a study. The government did a study and realized that this drug is not effective at all. And Mr. Wright, who trusted now what he read in the magazine, he fell into a depression and his cancer came back. This time, Dr. West, he came back to see the doctor again. And Dr. West, who genuinely wanted to help this patient, decided to get very sneaky. Okay? He told Mr. Wright that, yeah, the first supply you know, of drug that had deteriorated during shipment made them less effective, but he had managed to get a new batch of highly concentrated ultra pure cryboison. Okay, he has backdoor, you know, op op uh, backdoor road to get this now. Okay, in Malaysia we always know how to you know bypass things to get it. So he tells his patient, "I have very special way to get it." But of course, it was a white lie. What he did was he injected Mr. Wright with distilled water, just water, nothing at all, and a miracle happened again. The tumors melted away, the fluid in his chest disappeared, and Mr. Wright was feeling great again, fantastic, totally free from cancer for two months. Unfortunately, the American Medical Association announced after two months 
later that a nationwide study of cryobosin proved the drug was utterly useless. Mr. Wright lost all faith in the treatment. His cancer came back and he died two days later. The end is not the important thing. The important thing is to keep this example shows very clearly that Mr. Wright is experiencing his thinking, not the drug. And the uncertainty of the cancer is not the problem. The problem is Mr. Wright's thinking about the uncertainty of the cancer. Think medicine is great, he got cured. Think medicine is infective, infected with cancer again. Okay, you might say that <clears throat> maybe this is only one works on one person. Okay, so I'll give you another example. To give you all these extreme examples is to show you even in extreme cases, it works. What more in our normal daily cases? So this is another real life case in New England Journal of Medicine. I couldn't find the date, but it's in New England Journal of Medicine, a journal of medicine. It must be at least 50 years back because you, you can't do this kind of thing now. So there is a doctor called Dr. Bruce Mosley, an orthopedic surgeon, very famous for surgeries he performed on um, painful knee, knee pain. Okay. In Malaysia also, I know there are a lot of people who have knee pain above certain age, starting from my age, 50 and above. So to prove how effective his surgery was, Dr. Bruce mostly designed a brilliantly controlled study. Okay. What he did was have a few groups of patients. Patients in one group of the study get Dr. Mosley's famous surgery. He was like very famous in America for uh, knee surgery. Another group underwent, underwent an elaborately crafted fake surgery, a sham surgery, during which the patient, patient was sedated, put on anesthetic. Three incisions were made on the same location as in the real surgery. And the patient was shown a pre-recorded tape of someone else's surgery on a monitor screen. That means not, not the patient's surgery, someone else's surgery was shown to him, but the knife never really cut onto the knee, okay? you'll be surprised in the result. Okay? Dr. Musni even splashed water to mimic the sound of the surgery. Then he sold the knee back out. Like he just made an artificial incision. There's no real cut. The really shocking thing that the researchers, researchers found was that get those who are getting the fake surgery had better result than the real surgery. The patients getting the fake surgery were actually having less knee pain compared to those who get the real surgery. Maybe the reason is they didn't go through the trauma of surgery. The, pain, the knee wasn't operated on. And in fact, when they interviewed one of the patients who was given a fake surgery, two years later, he said, my knee, the knee that's operated on, which was never operated on, has never bothered me since. It's just like an, another, the other knee now, exactly the same. So that's how powerful the mind can be. Now, another example that I, I like, which I recently hear about us living in our thinking. I like this example because it's quite interesting. It's about an American lady living in a state in America which recently legalized marijuana. And this lady, she can't stand the smell of marijuana. So she was very upset when marijuana was legalized. Okay. And she suddenly realized that she keeps smelling marijuana. And to her, she think that, you know, oh my, this you know, bloody neighbors, everyone must be smoking marijuana and you know, really make me really frustrated and irritated. And she decided to switch, you know, close all her windows. But after she closed all her windows, she realized that she keep, still keeps smelling the marijuana smell. And she got more frustrated as in, it, it, it must have got into my house and then uh, they must have smoked so much that, you know, it, my whole house is filled with it. And then suddenly he starts smelling himself. She's herself and she starts realizing that it's all over my body. How can it be? And suddenly she realized, oh, a week ago, she started using her own deodorant and it's made from lemongrass and lemongrass has similar smell as marijuana. Actually, the smell all along wasn't marijuana. It's her own lemongrass. And she was upset with her neighbors for doing nothing. So we quite often create a lot of stories in, in our head and we believe it. That, that's the problem. If we can see through the, that they are just stories and you don't even have to stop them. 
you can even laugh at them. You can let them go on as long as you don't believe them, like the loud aircon noise. Okay. Another um, point I want to go on this is that we always think living in uncertain times or uncertainty means suffering or bad. Not always. It might be things that we, it might be situation that we don't want to wish to go through, but it doesn't really mean bad. Okay. Um, one example is me and my mom in her last months, the final month of her life. At that time, there was a lot of uncertainty. Okay, we know quite likely she's going to die, but we didn't know how long. And of course, we are wishing for a miracle to happen. Okay. I can say it's a very difficult time, uncertain time, and very painful time because my, uh, the nurse in the floor that's taking care of my mom, all of them knows my name and my dad's name because every time my mom is in pain, she'll be shouting our name. But looking back, to me, that's the most memorable time. I wouldn't call it really suffering. It's painful, yes. But in fact, I would say it's memorable because I'm glad I did what I could do, the best I could do at the time. My dad and me take turns, 24 hours I stayed next to my mom and then my dad took over 24 hours and so on for a month over. And my brothers came in to help in between. So to me, it's, it's not the situation that causes pain. It's... The situation might be painful. It's not a situation that causes suffering. It's our thinking. If you keep thinking, oh, why does it happen to me? How come it is? Instead of doing the best we can, giving the best we can, it, it changes a lot, your attitude towards the situation. Now, and also through, I can feel very glad because we did the best we could for my mom and she was extremely grateful for our constant presence. So, at least we know that she lived with lots of gratitude and happiness that her family members did the best we can for her. So on this point, I also like to touch on um, trauma. Trauma doesn't have to be suffering, like what I say. But if you look at trauma to solve our uh, problem, our suffering, then it usually will cause us a lot of uh, suffering. Why? If you look for past trauma for answer, it's like you are blowing up a balloon in front of you. All you see is the balloon and not the things in front of you at the moment. All you see is your trauma. Okay? The, more you, the further you go into the past, into your trauma, the more details you can remember and it complicates the way you want to put in solution because you keep living in your thinking. Okay? The details of this thinking of the trauma were only important to Proof to your ego that the problem exists. It makes the situation worse. And one analogy someone give I like is, it's like you are trying to find the bottom of a hole that you are still digging. You are still digging the hole and you're trying to find the bottom of it. So relieving past trauma, it, it's not usually very helpful. Okay, If it's for you to, to went out your frustration, then maybe, but it's not really the best way. The best way is to see that as long as you don't relieve the trauma, the trauma can't affect you. Now, the second point I want to, second reality in life, the first reality just now is we are living in our thinking, abstract, uh, not living in our life. The second reality I want to point out is no matter what happened to us, we have love, peace, happiness inside us. You don't have to search outside. In fact, we are made out of love, peace, and happiness. It's just that we didn't pay attention to it. Why do I say that? Have you ever looked or find a baby that's depressed? If you have, please tell me. Okay? There are no baby with suffering from depression, only adults suffering from depression. Why? Because baby have a childlike nature that we all of us have when we were baby. That's what we call natural love, peace, and happiness. Now, at this moment, try to be aware of your feeling whatever feeling that is there, okay? You realize that there is awareness and there's feeling itself. The feeling can be volatile. You can be maybe restless, upset, whatever. But that awareness is always calm. No matter what happened, the awareness is calm. So as long as we don't identify with the emotion, that volatile emotion, but instead stay with the awareness, 
you'll be okay with whatever, not okay emotions. And this is the home base for us to stand on, the ground for us to stand on without uncertainty, without doubt, without any lack of clarity. So every time when you are lost in your thoughts, you can always go back to this natural childlike calm and peace inside you. And this is the home base. To give you an example is there's an American coach who shared experience that one time when his child, his daughter was in critical state in the ICU, he was very anxious, very lost. But he realized that in that anxiety, in that tension, there is a calm, peaceful feeling at the background. And he can stay at that calm, peaceful feeling throughout that situation. You don't have to get rid of your anxiety. You don't have to get rid of your anger. You just stay with that background, calm, peaceful feeling, and you will not be affected by whatever that comes. It's to, I call it it's the stillness in the middle of a volatile emotion. The feeling is with, it's, the, it's a feeling of being with what is rather than the idea or concept of what is. That means rather than thinking what is. You just be with whatever emotion rather than thinking, oh, now I'm really anxious. Oh, I'm really, what will happen next? Rather than going into that, you just be whatever feeling that there is. And when you do that, it's an opening feeling. Even if it's sadness, it will open up. Waves of sadness will come and go if you don't hold on to them. This is the power of impermanence. And unfortunately, Buddhists, quite often we don't make use of what we know. Impermanence is very useful, very powerful. We only see the negative. We always think, you no know, Buddhists are very pessimistic, everything impermanence. Impermanence is very powerful. It means bad things can disappear. They won't stay. Nothing stays. When you are in this feeling, it keeps open up. But when we are in thinking, you will realize that. You will realize when you are in thinking, it's always contracting. And we will suffer our sadness and so on instead of opening up. So you will know. Actually, all of us have this inbuilt in us. I'm just pointing to you what you already have in you. Okay. It's like when you can see what's on the, on the screen without holding on to it, it will pass us by itself. You don't have to do anything. Okay. When you touch inside this, just you know, this awareness, quietness inside you, the wisdom will guide you directly because we are not caught up in what we should be doing. Seeing that we are thinking, the thinking going on the screen and realizing we are the screen, not the thinking, you can be present now. Okay, You can be not caught up in the thinking. And then you allow yourself to be filled with love, guided by wisdom, that always this wisdom and love will always guide us to, a tri to, to be thriving. And it's always beautiful. And... It's ordinary as in it's always in us all the time and spontaneous. And at this moment, I want to share another story about Dr. Bill Paddock, which is a uh, famous psychiatrist in the sense that he do very unconventional way. He's still living in America. He don't believe that any human has mental problem. To him, every single human has natural mental health, including schizophrenia and bipolar. Okay. In fact, there is one uh, mental patient who says that the first time he, she met doc, uh, Dr. Bill Paddock, she was highly sedated and all that. And Dr. Bill Paddock told him, you are actually mentally healthy. And her first thought was, finally, they sent a doctor who is as mad as me to treat me. And she was cured, actually. Okay, so she, he has a very good record, Dr. Bill Paddock. I want to tell you an interesting story of his, one of his patients, as in he, he had one old lady, about 80 years old, who for 30 or 40 years suffering from depression. And he tried to explain to her that it comes from your thinking, that you know, your emotions come from your thinking and so on. She just can't see. After four days, he, he almost gave up for the first time. And he looked at the lady, old lady and says, have you ever been happy? And to his surprise, the old lady looked at him and says, yes, every morning. 
And Dr. Pugh Bennett was shocked. He says, but then what happened? She says, then I started thinking all the reasons why I shouldn't be happy, all the reasons why I should be depressed. And I got into my depression. When she said that, suddenly she caught herself. It's like, yeah, I was actually naturally happy. It's my thinking that got me into my depression. And she got out of it. She solved the problem for 40 years. So, but now I want to share with you, uh, I want to read out from a book, okay? This is a personal life experience of uh, Mara Gleason. Very strange name, okay? Because for us, no one in Buddhist uh, will call themselves Mara. Her name is Mara, actually. Mara Gleason. She's a co-founder of an international non-profit organization dedicated to solving large-scale global issues like political issues, organization issues by illuminating a new understanding of the mind, by teaching people how the mind works, by what I share with you just now. Okay? That's her, her professional job. Below is the account of her, her life-threatening experience when she was on a student exchange program in Buenos Aires. This is some years back. Now she's you know, about 40s already. It's a good example. I want to read this is because it's a good example of how when the I, ourself, get out of the way, miracle can happen even in times of uncertainty, as in, in times of life and death. In this story, she was walking with her two new girlfriends towards a tango bar in a crime-infested area in Buenos Aires. Please remember, uh, Mara is her name, but you can also refer Mara as in Mara, the ego self. Okay, I'll read from a book. About halfway down the block, out of nowhere, we were cut off by two guys on the motorbike. When the two guys on the motorbike hopped on the, up on the sidewalk in front of us, the man at the back jumped off and grabbed me on my arms. My girlfriends were able to escape before either of the guys grabbed hold of them. Once the man had my arm firmly in his grip, he reached down his pants, and I distinctly remember the last couple of Mara thoughts I had meaning that familiar in-body recognizable voice I know to all too well, which the thoughts were, oh, seriously, he's going to pull his dick out? I felt a wave of fear and disappointment as I figured, okay, he's either going to expose himself to me or full on try to rape me. This is not going to be good. But before I could even finish following the train of thoughts in that familiar Mara, as in the self, tone of voice, I felt the cold matter click tick of a gun against my temple. And the last thought I had was, that's not his dick. He, did, he pulled out his pants. That's a gun. And then the world went silent. That voice that was always yapping in my head just shut up. The one that is constantly chit-chatting about where to go, what to do, asking how am I feeling, how do I look, what do I want to talk about, what's the next in life, yada, yada, and so on, all day long. It just stopped. It was as if somehow it knew something. I say it because at that moment, I felt myself go away, the self go away. And some bigger intelligence kicked in that knew more than I did. It understood that Mara's little yip yapper was irrelevant. There was nothing in the realm of me that had knowledge of how to deal with this situation. So without intentionally doing it, I simply shut up and got out of the way or it, that larger intelligence, knew to put me as, to the side, much like you would push a clueless, distracted pedestrian out of the way of an incoming bus to save their life. All my thoughts, all the noise that usually makes up the mind, the identity of Mara Gleason went quiet. In that silence, something amazing occurred. I will try to describe it, but it's going to fall short. Words cannot capture it. Yeah, words cannot capture the reality of life. You see, now I'm back in my little yip yapping Mara mind, trying to describe something that was far beyond the littleness of me. So please forgive me if it sounds silly. I will do my best to be honest and clear about what occurred with the language I have, but the experience was truly beyond me. When my head felt silent upon feeling the gun against my temple, the sensation that emerged in the silence was indescribably huge, like a wave of vast energy. Not the personal energy, beautifully quiet, the buzzing raw force behind life, like a kind of super knowing, not the brain knowing, but much bigger spiritual knowing. Without the separateness 
of my Mara thinking, I was merely an energetic experience connected to the fabric of all energy, not an individual drop, but the whole ocean. I was not raised in a religious or even particularly spiritual home, but I knew that what I was experiencing was the definition of a power greater than oneself, because myself, driven by normal thinking, was gone. Yet there were small glimpses of little personal Mara thoughts that came to me like, wow, what pop, that pop as in as I realized I was looking at the gunman's hand in my, on my arm, but I couldn't distinguish a physical end to my body and a start to his. Everything blended together. Then when I looked beyond him to a tree that was glowing out in the sidewalk, I couldn't really separate the singular block of energy that was he and I from the tree. Everything become one. Again, no end and no beginning, just one continuous flow. And then I weakly remembered that when he originally put the gun to my temple, he had said, give me your wallet. I had not made a move to find my wallet as I was too absorbed in this experience of one continuous energy. What was perhaps the most surprising and lovely aspect of the oneness was that I felt enormously profound love for the man holding my arm and the gun at my head. Not the kind of love we normally think of, like the love we have for our romantic partners or our family members, but rather a deep impersonal love that goes beyond our separate selves, our ideas, our preference, our expectations, a much more universal love, something that come through, can only come through silence. As I was having this experience, which I would describe as an out-of-body experience, he, my mother, began to have it too, how do I know? I just know because for a moment, he and I were the same. I was in him, he was in me. We were one, as well as the trees and everything else, I suppose. I recall feeling completely confident and at peace. Whether he shot me then and there or whether I walked away and kept living my little Mara existence, I knew there was a greater intelligence behind life and there was no real end or beginning. And then a thought came true. I felt a wave of fear wash over him or us, and I opened my mouth to speak. The only words I would say to him during the entire experience, I said, you are scared, and that's okay. I don't know if I was speaking to him or to me, or if the, if the bigger it was saying to both of us. After the words were said, he looked into my eyes and his whole body softened. We exchanged a moment of knowing and acknowledge, of acknowledging what had just happened. And then I gave him his arm back. I took it from my bicep and put it back along beside his body. Then I turned and walked away. That's the end of my reading of this uh, abscess. I find it very beautiful as in, to me, it's described very well of a mini enlightened experience. When they say when a, a, a person become a sotapan, of course, hers is not really full enlightenment. You can get a glimpse of it. When a person becomes a sotapan, they don't need to make any effort to keep the five precepts because it's natural to them. When you and others has no separation, you don't need to effort to not kill other person. You won't kill yourself. You won't steal from yourself because everyone is one. But everyone's one doesn't mean there's a one big one. In Buddhism, is we, we don't even have a one big one. Everything exists dependently on each other. So, okay, you can see, okay, when the I get out of the way, I, you, and everything become one, there's no longer separation. When there's no separation, there's no fear, insecurity, worry, etc., because all this emotion arises due to the self, the I, not due to the uncertainty or the danger. When this happens, you no longer have problems with uncertainty. Everything, you know, um, go out of the way. Uncertainty arises from our thinking. Thinking is impermanent. It changes by itself. As our thinking changes, uncertainty changes. At every moment, we can only do the best we can given the thinking we have. So important is we don't have to blame ourselves. We just know that we do the best according to our thinking. When you realize this, you, as long as you don't hold on to your thinking, we can keep progressing into higher level of consciousness. We can see more things. As I've explained above, the best way to live in times of uncertainty is to awaken to the reality of how life works, which is number one, we live in our thinking of life, not life itself. Number two, when the I get out of the way, our innate wisdom will take over 
and you can do much, much more greater things. Although using this wisdom is the best approach, there are other techniques, okay? Because human likes techniques. Nowadays, I, I prefer using wisdom, but sometimes we still need some techniques before we, we can see clearly. So I will tell you a list in, in Buddhism, we have lots of techniques, okay? That can help us more resilience in times of uncertainty. The first method is contemplation on the qualities of the Buddha, Buddha no Sati. We can do it now, just short while. You just visualize, you can leave your eyes open or, or close or whatever. Visualize a peaceful image of the Buddha. And then you can either recite Itipiso, Bhagawa, Arahang, and so on. Or you can just recite Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. Or just recite Arahang, Arahang, Arahang. And keep dwelling on this peaceful image of the Buddha. Just continue to, to see a peaceful image, smiling image of a Buddha or whatever image that is in your mind. And you can either recite Arahang or Buddha. <laughs> Okay, we won't dwell too long on this. You can do longer uh, in your daily life. Um, just for information, the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, said that by looking at the serene image of a Buddha that he had with him when he was in jail during the Buddhist rule, helped him pass through uncertain times. And he was not even a Buddhist. So he will do much more help to us Buddhists. Now, the second method, also very simple, is just to take deep breath. When you take a deep breath by opening up your chest, instead of doing this, normally we breathe like this because we're always looking at our phones, looking at our computer like this. So I call this stressful breathing because you only take in small amount of oxygen. If you can open up your chest, then this, it will automatically bring down your stress response and kicks in the uh, healing response. So you will automatically um, calm down very quickly, just by this deep breathing, okay? And the third method, very simple also, is to just observe your breath. So we won't go into it, it's just anapanasati. When you watch your breath, this Buddha's antidote for if you're very restless, lost in your thoughts, just watch your breath. The fourth method is just to feel your body, okay? To embody, to stay in the body. When you put your attention in your body, you cannot be in your head, in, lost in your thinking. So just feel your body. Like now, can you feel the weight of your body, the hardness of your body? You know, the, your, your, just feel the, the, the whole body. Okay? When you feel your body, definitely all your tensions of thinking has to come out. You have to, you know, you'll be, you're out of the, the tensions. Okay. The fifth method is to constantly dwell in the four divine abidings, metta, um, Bhante Punaji described it as universal benevolence, karuna, universal compassion, mudita, selfless happiness, upeka. He described it, normally we call it equanimity. He described it as insightful perception, as in no fixed perception. Okay, And this one, uh, Professor Richard Davidson has done many experiments showing that Meditators who dwell on compassion has a much higher resilience than ordinary people. So very useful for times of uncertainty because your resilience level go up. You might ask how they did it. They did tests by showing very violent, gruesome scenes to each test participants and the time, the time that they take to return to the normal mind. And nearly all the, you can say, all the compassion med meditators who meditate on metta or karuna compassions return to normal mind state almost immediately. Of course, their mind will go into a shock, but immediately they will go back compared to normal people. So I encourage you to do uh, metta or karuna. Of course, 
for those in BGF, you can follow Wednesday night's uh, meta meditation by Dato Sri Victor Wee. That's, that's a good way for you to strengthen your meta and hence your resilience, your meta and your karuna. So um, there are five, I've shared you five methods, but the best, of course, if you can use the wisdom. Now, I just want to end by reading you a story for you to contemplate, very short story, okay? Because I just want to point out to everyone that since we are living in a world created by thoughts, you, we can say that we are actually living in a dream because dreams are also created by thoughts. And I always find dreams fascinating because we can create monsters to chase us ourselves, not realizing that we are the one who created it. And we can get very scared about it. We are the audience, we are the director, we are the producer, we are the actor, we are everything. And we, are, we can even enjoy the show or maybe scared of a show um, created by ourselves. So this story is, for me is quite interesting. It's a, it's a dream a story taken from meditation by Rene Descartes. It's a, uh, in maybe, I don't know which century, maybe 200 years ago. He's a famous French philosopher, mathematician, scientist. And this is for you to ponder. Lucy was having an awful nightmare. She was dreaming that wolf-like monsters had burst through the windows in her bedroom while she was asleep. And then she started to tear, and started to tear her apart. She fought and screamed, but she could feel their claws and teeth tear into her. Then she awoke, sweating and breathing heavily. She looked around her bedroom just to be sure and let out a sigh of relief that it had all indeed been a dream. Then with a heart-stopping crash, monsters burst through her window and started to attack her just as in her dream. The terror was magnified by the remembrance of the nightmare that she had just endured. Her screams were mixed with sobs as she felt the helplessness of her situation. Then she awoke, sweating even more, breathing even faster. This was absurd. She had dreamed within a dream. And so the first time she had apparently woken up, she was in fact still in a dream. She looked around her room again. The windows were intact. There were no monsters. But how could she be sure that she had already woken up this time. She waited, terrified, for time to tell. So when we wake up from our dream in the morning, are you very sure that you have really woken up from a dream or you have just woken up from a dream in a dream? Okay, I'll end here. Questions? Thank you, Bhante, for the... Uh... Very interesting talk on uh, living in our thoughts. We will now uh, take some questions from the part participants in the Zoom room. So if you have any questions, kindly raise your hands and we'll unmute you and uh, you can ask Bante the questions before we open up the question to the Zoom room, to the Facebook audience. Anybody has any questions you'd like to ask Bante? Any questions that you have? Or any sharing you have also is okay. <laughs> Maybe Bante, I can start off with a question. Okay. Hmm. Bante, how do we stop those... Uh, Persistent thinking, those are, uh, some minds are always thinking all the time. Okay, good question. Okay, in fact, actually, I did answer in my talk. It's basically, you can't stop thinking. When you try to stop thinking, it will be more persistence. You have to slowly realize that the thinking is created by you. It's not real. The reason the thinking is persistent is we, number one, we think that our thinking is a fact. It's an ultimate reality. Number two is we think that if we 
No, not we think, we believe. We believe that our thinking is the ultimate reality, is a fact. We believe that if we don't stop thinking, if we don't continue thinking, we will not be able to solve our problems. You have to have start with a little faith that your intelligence is very small compared to the wisdom of the universe. If you don't get stuck with this small intelligence, you get access to a much larger wisdom. It's like you are trying to rely on your data in your computer instead of allowing yourself to go into the internet to have infinite amount of wisdom. But you need to have a little bit of faith to, to start off. Not blind faith, but faith to, to explore in this area. Explore that if you don't use your small intelligent thinking, you get much more bigger wisdom. And number two is what you are thinking is not a fact. It's your story created by yourself. I just shared with, uh, um, on this note, I just shared with uh, the audience yesterday or no, Friday that our stories we think is so real. Like for me, right up to when I was in uh, university, all my friends were in KL only because I stay in KL, I grew up in KL. So to me is all Malaysian Chinese speaks Cantonese only because this is my world, okay? But when I went to um, Australia to study, almost none of the Malaysian students there speaks Cantonese. They either speak Hokkien or Mandarin. I was like, what, what happened to the world? How come the world changed? No, the world didn't change. It's my, my understanding of the world is so limited. So, but we think it's true. I always think it's a fact. You know, only when I come back, I realize that, yeah, only Malaysians in uh, KL and Ipoh only speaks uh, Cantonese. And in fact, now, you, now, even in KL, most people speak Mandarin. So um, that's not a fact. So you have to be willing to, uh, to renounce. To me, this is the definition of renunciation I like. A lot of people think renunciation means to become monks and nuns. No, I, I don't agree with that. Some people think renunciation is to give up material thing. I think the more powerful renunciation is the courage to renounce your concept, opinions, belief, your ideas. That's a real renunciation. Not to hold on to any concepts, ideas, and belief. And that's tough. Yeah, but we can do it. It's tough, but it can be done. And it's very powerful if you can renounce this. I was sharing with uh, the YS committee, BMS YS committee, that there's this real case, okay? In, I can't remember which university in US, there's a new first year student who went in, do a medical experiment, and he managed to successfully conduct it. And he didn't think it's a big deal. And then he did it, the professor asked him to do you know, another nine times, and all 10 times he's successful. Then everyone got a shock because that experiment, no one has ever been successful in the first try. They need to do at least five, six tries. And even professors, they, they take time, like few tries to get successful. But no one ever told this newbie that it's a difficult experiment. He didn't know it's a difficult. And he became successful. He wasn't locked in his thinking. So our thinking, um, not so reliable but we think it's very reliable. So I used to give this example that um, our thinking is like our advisor. You know, our, if you have an advisor in a company and you're a CEO, an advisor always gives you wrong decision, what do you do? Will you do? Sack him. Okay, so um, that's what you need to do. I'm not saying that the intellect is useless. Intellect serves us well as long as you're the master of the intellect, not a slave. Unfortunately, we become a slave to our intellect instead of a master of intellect. If you are a master of your intellect, very useful. Okay, uh, questions next? Yeah, thank you, Bante. There's a question from uh, Facebook. Okay. Bante, how to meditate on the four Brahma Viharas? Oh, join Datuk Sri Dr. Wee's uh, session on Wednesday night. He will teach you how to meditate on uh, Metta. The rest are... Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Opeka is not four separate things. There are four facets of the of a same thing. It's basically um, having love 
for yourself, when you have love for yourself, then it will expand out to have compassion for all, all beings. Because you and other beings are interconnected, then you also slowly understand this deepen, deepen more and you rejoice with everyone's uh, achievements. You'll be one with them and then you have an equanimity. So uh, uh, it's four, four, four aspects of the same thing. Or you can normally just, you know, just sit down and wish yourself to be well and happy or just feel, just have a, uh, have a smile on your heart a smile on your face or remember back the happiest moment if you have in your life, but don't dwell in the story. Otherwise you get lost. Just capture that emotion of happiness of that event and then stay with that happiness and allow this good feeling to flow in your whole body and out to all beings. So uh, very powerful. Any? Yeah. Thank you. Question from Ken Tio. Have you written, Bante, have you written any book by any chance? Would like to read your book? Personally, I have not, but me and my friends have written um, a book called Jataka. What we did was, me and my friends, we like to do unconventional thing. Okay, You can find this, um, if you go to Facebook, uh, Mahapurisa Tipitaka, uh, Maha as in M-A-H-A P-U-R-I-S-A Tipitaka T-I-P-I-T-A-K-A -I uh, okay. Or even if you go to a website www.mahapurisa.org um, You will be able to retrieve that book It's uh, Jataka But it's very unconventional Not many people can You can understand the stories Because it's just stories not people, people can get the Dharma behind it, but it, it, you can try because uh, it's, we try to read, write very deep drama, uh, deep drama, yeah, deep Dharma in deep drama. And uh, the story we choose are very unconventional story, as in Bodhisattva uh, being a robber, Bodhisattva being a, a gangster head, uh, Bodhisattva being a, a, even a murderer and so on. So um, not to, not to, um, not to say anything bad, but it's to try to point to people that Buddhism is not about morality. Morality is good. Okay, D don't go around saying Bante says uh, more, uh, don't be moral. Moral is pretty is good, but the aim of Buddhism is awakening to the reality of life. If you get stuck on holding on, I have to be a moral person. You are still stuck. Okay. You are not getting out of the cycle of birth and death. The key thing is to awaken to a reality. So Bodhisattva will use all means. And of course, he has to pay for it. There is no free lunch. So anyway, if you can get the book at either mahapurisa.org or Facebook. Okay. Another question, Bhante. During my meditation, I sometimes feel myself getting huge, bright and peaceful but then collapse to being very small and dark. Please advise Bhante. One of the reasons most probably is you're holding on to that experience. Um, that's why all, all meditation teachers usually advise meditators not to, to ignore all experience, even if it's good experience, to ignore them, not hold on to them. Because when you hold on to them, then you get lost. So that's maybe the the... I wouldn't say definitely, but maybe one of the reasons. Another question on meditation. During my meditation, all the regrets in my life emerged. What is happening? Ah. Normally, when you're too busy over your, on your head, you don't have time to think. When you quiet down, then all the thoughts and all that that you suppress will come out. It's not a problem as long as like I say throughout my talk, uh, throughout my talks, uh, this today sharing is that you don't have to be afraid of your emotions or your thoughts, as long as you realize they are not real, they are not true, they are stories. So, and Buddhists always have this problem: we are very afraid of our anger, we are very afraid of our sadness. We think that Buddhists cannot be angry and so on. Anger is not a problem. In fact. Um, 
anger can be a form of love, as in it's an indicator to tell us that we have gone off track. So this depends on what's your attitude towards your emotions and thoughts. So as long as you don't take them as enemy or something bad, and then it can be very useful. In fact, it can be a very powerful tool. You can use anger to have to learn a lot of wisdom. Because the next time someone says something and you get angry, you can use it as a chance, as opportunity to see that. Can you see the anger comes from your thoughts of why did he say that? Why did he insult me? How come he did that to me? It's not from what he said. And in fact, he might have said, he might have insulted you one sentence, but you are insulting and slapping yourself 1,000 times. Can you see that? When you can see that, you have a lot of joy and you can laugh at your own anger. So anger is not a problem. It's, it's a good indicator. It's a friend. Okay. Any questions or anyone from the Zoom? Any other questions? Chat box or... Okay, uh, can you unmute yourself, Po Chi? Sorry. Um, but, but there's a lot of questions, on, uh, there's a lot of videos on hypnosis. What's your opinion on this? Uh, okay, let me answer Po Chi's uh, question, then I'll answer hypnosis. Yeah, go ahead, Po Chi. Uh, Bante, uh. dreams are actually thoughts from long ago that hasn't been like settled, right? It could be, yes. Yeah. So how do we uh, like settle it and don't want any of those dreams? Oh, easy. Don't regard them as real. Same as how you settle the normal thoughts. It, it's okay as long as um, you don't treat it as real. Don't take it too seriously. It's like you can go to a mo you can pay money to go to watch a ghost movie and get frightened, but it's not a problem because you don't think it's real. In fact, you enjoy getting frightened in a ghost mode. I don't, but a lot of people do. What, what do you hear? Um, Bante just say, don't treat it as real. Yeah. How do we do that? How do we do that? You just, you just don't treat it as real, as in... Um, there's no technique as in you got to see it's not real you got to basically in your normal day see that it's not it's created by you you got to experiment with that um, it's like a, it's like how do I know this is a phone I just saw it's a phone how do I know I have a hand I, I, I just know I have a hand so you just have to uh, see. I, I don't know, anyone has a good idea of to see it's not real because for me, it's, uh, it's created by us, so it's not real. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. I'll, I'll ponder more. If I have an easy answer, I will let you know. Thank you. Yeah. But of course, when I say it's, uh, don't see as real, there are many times I have blind spot. Okay. Although inside me, deep down inside me, knows that the thoughts is known, there are still times when I still get upset and say, no, it's definitely him who caused me this anger. But very quickly, I realized that, no, it's not. It's my thought again. But you've got to keep exploring. There will be many times you will get um, lost in your thoughts thinking it's real, of course. It doesn't mean once you see it, once you will see it all the time. I'm just saying that um, once you see it, it's at the back of your mind all the time. You will still get lost because of the blind spot. I myself get lost a lot of time, but easier to get out of it if you have it at the background. So one way for you maybe is try to keep exploring that it's, uh, it's not real. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Okay. Maybe, okay. maybe a story here before we go to hypnosis, a quick story will help you. Um, there's a, a teacher... Uh, she shared quite a few in, in my series of talks. Uh, she says that when she was transferred to a new school one day, 
the colleagues told her, uh, sorry, no, not told, reprimanded her for making a few mistakes. And she immediately got very upset, like really upset with the colleague. It's like, I'm, my first day, why you pick on me? And like, really, you, because of her reaction and all that, there was like tension between her and colleague. And she went back and she couldn't sleep. The whole night was like brewing away, got very upset. Then suddenly she remembered, Bhante says, you know, all this comes from my thoughts. It's my thinking that caused me angry. And she cooled down. Then the next day went to apologize to the colleague. And when you, it's quite interesting when you apologize to people, people get a shock because people always think that, you know, when you start fighting, people always get ready to fight. When you suddenly, you don't fight, people get a shock. So the colleague also say, oh, sorry, don't, don't worry about it. Maybe I've gone overboard. And they become good friends and started off on a good foot instead of, you know, bad, bad uh, starting on a, on a new posting, new job. So yeah, maybe pondering that will, will help you as in not to, it doesn't serve you to think the thoughts as real. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Bobby was saying something about hypnosis. Can you summarize maybe? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, self-help uh, guides on using hypnosis to like uh, cure yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, uh, so cure problems and all this. Yeah. Huh? So, okay, uh, what is my viewpoint on hypnosis? I don't really like to uh, people to hypnotize me or I hypnotize myself. It's, uh, it's just me, okay? I have nothing against uh, hypnosis if it helps you, okay? But for me, the thing that helps more is to use wisdom to see that all your thoughts are not real. That's much more powerful. If you can really see it, it will definitely change your life. You don't become a slave to your thoughts. Um, hypnosis is very powerful now, of course. I don't uh, ignore this fact. In fact, in America and also in Malaysia, there are groups that use hypnosis to solve uh, problems from past life. They call it past life regression therapy. Like there are some people who keep having neck pain because in past life they were hanged. They can't let go of that trauma. So they use this hypnosis to go back there and let go of the experience. But I would rather if you use wisdom to not hold on to any trauma in the past. That way, you can get kill two birds with one stone, as in you solve your trauma and you solve, you get closer towards Nibbana, towards awakening to the, to the truth. So I prefer this way than uh, hypnosis. If it helps you, to me, I have nothing against anything that helps uh, people. Whatever way that helps you, it, 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 you can use. Okay. Another question. Okay, thank you. Mante, in Samatha meditation, how does one know that one has meditated correctly when one meditates on Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka? Oh, it's easier if you get a teacher to guide you, okay? But there are few guidelines um, in Samatha as in, if you, after you meditate, you come out, and you feel very lost, very blur, blur, you are living in another world, uh, not, not too right. If you are floating, um, you might think you are right, but not so right. You should, when you come up from meditation, you should feel bright, alert, um, aware. Um, so that's one thing. And of course, if you get more sad when you do Metta Karuna Mudita Upeka, more depressed, then definitely not right. So they are, they are what do you call, um, common sense, way to, to tell yourself. But of course, uh, if you have a teacher, always is good. So that's why for me, for Buddhists, it's quite useful to make the aspiration to have a teacher to guide us. Okay. When I say a teacher, it could be your dog. Okay, it, it doesn't have to be a teacher as in someone you pray to and all that. It could be your, ch your children or your parents or whatever. It could be the tree. Okay, uh, Teacher can come in many, many forms. But we need uh, someone to guide us, especially when we are lost uh, or friends. So uh, please make aspiration that we have good friends, good teachers to, to guide us. And that's very important. I always have this very strong aspiration uh, that I always have good teacher to, to guide me. Thank you, Bhante. Next question, Bhante. How does one abandon anger? Ah. Uh, this one, very good question. Actually, I thought I, I saw it in, in my sharing, okay? Is to see with wisdom that you are, okay, it's a good question because I want to elaborate on it. Anger, actually, 
you have to see that it's not the if you when you see that anger doesn't come from the person, it comes from you, okay, from your thought, you as in your thought, then usually you won't continue slapping yourself. I call it slapping yourself as in you are when you're angry, you are burning yourself, or your your heart will feel very painful and you'll feel burned. Okay. So number one is um you got to see there are a few things that help you. One is to see that. That anger is not created by out there. It's created by your thoughts. If are you thinking, why does he say that? How come he do that to me? And so on. When you see that, you might not want to continue with this thinking. And second thing to help is to, to see that you're quite stupid to continue being angry because the person might really do something bad. Why, if you really do something bad, why do you torture yourself for the bad thing that he did? It might be even wiser, of course, Buddhists don't do that, to punch him. But you are punching yourself. Being angry is very, it's very uh, painful. If you're really aware, if you calm down, because I know because I'm, I'm, uh, I must say I'm not a very patient person, so I get anger quite fast. But then now I can detect the, the burning heart quite fast. So why do I want to burn my heart, continue to burn my heart? It's like when you see your hand is in fire, do you need any method to bring your hand out of the fire, it, you don't. You just put your head out from the fire. It's like you don't need any method at all. It's like when you, but you have to need a bit of awareness. Unless you are, uh, I don't know what's the word, say, say this or there's a word for it. People who like to torture themselves. You know? I, I'm sure you are not uh, those type of, of masonists, masonists, person who torture themselves. I'm quite sure you, you are not that type of person then you wouldn't want to continue torturing yourself because not so wise and you don't gain anything. In fact, you're helping the person. The person say something to make you angry is to maybe torture you, but you're helping him to torture yourself more. So not so, not so brilliant, not so wise. <laughs> okay. Ante, uh, thank you. Next two questions are the same. Do we dream what we think? And can we say our dreams are our imagination of our thoughts? Dreams actually, uh, some there are some uh, psychiatrists and uh, uh, psychotherapists who say that dreams actually is not really bad. It's a form of releasing the tension we have in our normal life. They are, for example, maybe um, some trauma we go to. Maybe we got um, abused when we were young or something, or you know, physically abused, and we can't handle that and it's really trapped inside us, it's a blockage inside us. In the dream, we might see you know, some a milder version of it, like monsters, maybe milder version, for us to, to let go that blockage. So it's not really uh, bad. Sometimes it could be for us to, to let, let go of uh, things we couldn't face, couldn't handle. Okay, any other questions? Mante, during your last Friday night guided meditation, I feel joy and so hot in my body. May I know why? You feel joy, that's good. Huh? <laughs> why? I, I, it could be you managed to touch the, the natural love or joy inside us, which all of us have. Actually, all of us have this natural love, joy, peace inside us. It's just that we are not aware. And it's very powerful when we are aware, then you don't have to look for, because all of us are looking for happiness, love and joy from outside. And the other person also is looking for love, joy and outside. So you try to get love from that person and the person love, try to get love from you and in the end struggle. But if you can see that you already have that love, joy, peace inside you, you can share with everyone. And then you build a stronger network of love, joy and peace. It's already in all of us. It's not something that you need to develop. Look at babies. Babies don't need a reason to be happy. You know, you can give them you know, the worst thing, they're still happy because they have no concept that this is bad, this is good, this is a better ice cream, this is a lousy ice cream. And they have no concept. It's the only way we have concept. So renunciation of concepts will help us, but maybe spend some time with babies, someone else's babies. Because your baby, you got to take care. <laughs> Next question, Bhante. 
how to reach out to a person who is depressed? Um, okay, good question. The key thing is your own grounding. Okay, if you can touch your own natural love, joy inside you, then when you are present, really present, that means you are, you are with your love, natural love, peace and joy, you don't have to say anything or do anything. Your presence with that depressed person will help that depressed person because no matter how depressed the person is, even the person who is gone totally cuckoo, there is natural mental health inside them. So in order for that natural mental health inside them to surface, you, your own self, need to stay in that natural mental health, that grounding. Your grounding is important. When you have this grounding, when you, when you are not lost in your thoughts, when you are back in this natural mental health, whatever you say is correct. Whatever you not say also is correct. But when you are trying to think of something to say to help the depressed person, chances are whatever you say, it's not correct. Even you're not saying anything, it's also not correct. So try to come from a natural love piece that you have. Pante, do you have regular meditation class? I don't have class, but on Friday night, um, eight o'clock, I call it uh, awareness of Dharma in daily drama. I start off by a longer meditation, like maybe 20, 21 minutes medita guided meditation. And I try to use different um, guided meditation each time. So every Friday I lead that. I like that because I, that is mainly a session for everyone to share how they can see Dharma in their daily drama. As in, for me, it's everything, every part in our life is not bad. You know, can you, when you're quarreling, can you see that there's dharma in there, that you get heated up in a quarrel because you are thinking your thoughts are giving you wrong information? Can you see that? Then your, your quarrel is not wasted. Can you see that when you are angry, it's your thoughts that making you more angry, infuriating you, that you are ruminating in your thoughts? Then your anger is not wasted. Every... Rubbish can be used to make into gold. So I, I love this uh, seeing Dharma in your daily drama. Pante, where is it posted? Where is it posted? Uh, uh, Facebook or what? Which okay. Facebook? Okay, you can go into Buddhist Missionary Society Malaysia's uh, Facebook. Or you can go into my Facebook, so I'll put it there. <laughs> Nyaninda, N-Y-A-N-I-N-D-A. Uh, either that or it's basically every every uh, when sorry when Friday night every Friday night you go into Buddhist Missionary Society Malaysia's uh, Facebook you should be able to find it it started a few weeks ago. So Buddhist Missionary Society Malaysia. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question, Bhante. As a person with a lot of critical and judgmental thoughts about things about others. How to overcome it? Okay, basically, yeah. Okay, same, same uh, answer. Okay, although I can see, you know, not people, not many people, so easy to see. But same answer as in, not to believe your judgmental thoughts as real. Okay, not take it as ultimate reality. Not take it as fact. Question your thoughts, then question your judgment. Question your opinion, and the other thing is. Uh, to see that we are naturally have love, peace, and happiness inside us and dwell in that more. That will both will solve this. They can take one or two more questions. Yeah, no problem. Is there any suggestion to deal with contamination OCD? There is this perception that things around are dirty. Thanks. Okay. As long as one day you see that your thoughts are real, you, you, as long as one day you, you, you see your thoughts are real, you can't stop your OCD. So 
one one way is you got to somehow learn not to trust your thoughts okay maybe what one this story i share with you will help um short story okay we have run over a little few minutes i hope no problem um back to that so uh, psychiatrist that i told you just now bill paddock who has a very unconventional way of treating people um he one time there was this businessman who has this uh, similar to OCD as in they lose in their think, live in their thinking. So this businessman, because of stress or whatever, he keeps seeing snakes everywhere. Like the secretary come in, you say snakes, snakes, and they can't do anything. They got to send him to a mental asylum. And uh, the the doctors there says that you know he's going to be committed there for life because they can't help him. And the wife was very desperate and got uh, Dr. Bill padded. And Dr. Bill Pettit says, I can help him, but it's a very unconventional way. You just have to accept. So what Dr. Bill Pettit did was, um, he knows that that place, the hospital, so he, all are his friends. What he did was he went to Chinatown and bought a whole, uh, took a, a borrowed a whole basket of uh, fake snakes, okay? And also got a uh, real, uh, it's called a big python, a bow, bow constrictor, okay? So he got this real, real snake, okay? He went to the room of this patient, put the ball constrictor in, in the shower. Ball constrictor likes their warm red towel, warm, uh, cold animal. So they like warm shower. So coil around there and put all the fake snakes everywhere. Then ask the uh, hospital helper to view this patient in, okay? This patient is heavily sedated because you know, they have to put him a lot of drugs because he just go crazy. Put him in. And then he took a while for him to adjust. And then suddenly he saw snakes. So I was like, snakes, snakes. He was shouting. And Dr. Pew Pader looked at him calmly and says, I will view you out on one condition. You must tell me which one is real snake, which one is fake snake, which one is imaginary snake. And you'll be surprised. Quite fast, this patient, that fake snake, this one, now imaginary is in my head. This one, real snake, this one, fake snake, this one in my head, imaginary, is not there. And they will help and he was soft. No more problem after that. Um, sometimes you need extreme case to wake us up. But as long as you not wake up to the fact that your imaginary snakes is really not there, you, it's a bit difficult. And it's quite cruel to tell people not to you know, check that it's really clean because they think it's not clean. So you have to somehow see that your thoughts are not real. Okay, I think okay. time. One last question okay. on anger. With regards to anger, could it be due to our expectation or wanting not met? Hence, anger arises. Yeah, it could be, but again, can you see your expectation not met is your thinking? Because expectation is created by your thinking. What? What, you know, um, it's created by yourself. Your, your expectation to another person is like, maybe it's an impossible thing, okay? When you live in an expectation, you are going to me, you're going to suffer. But I'm not saying that don't set goals. You can set goals, but if you set goals and expect that you must meet the goals, you, you're going to suffer because you can't, you can't control the world. That's what I said in the beginning of my sharing. You can do your best, but you can't control the world. But you can control to, on what you respond, how you respond to what the world gives you. And to me, maybe I, one thing to end is, um, if your definition of success, try to ponder away, if your definition of success is happiness and contentment, then it solves a lot of your problem. It doesn't mean you won't try to do anything, but your priority is happiness and contentment. Then your life will be much happier. Okay, okay I think that, uh, thank you Bhante for your very meaningful sharing on uh, thoughts uh, not real and that uh, most of problems comes from our thoughts, not the reality outside. So uh, we'd like to invite Bhante to share merits and uh, do aspirations and then uh, we end with that. Thank you Bhante.